Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a possible setback for the Plaza de Panama project in Balboa Park. A judge says the city broke the rules in giving it the okay. And rising sea levels could become a big problem for plans to expand San Diego's downtown convention center. We cannot continue as a nation with 11 million people residing in the shadows. A group of Senate Democrats and Republicans say they have a plan for immigration reform. We'll have a look at their proposals. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. A tentative court ruling could spell trouble for San Diego's Plaza de Panama project. KPBS reporter Katie Orr joins us from the News Center with more on this story. I understand the project may hang on a legal interpretation, Katie. What is it? Well, Duane, the phrase is reasonable beneficial use. Under San Diego's municipal code, the city cannot touch an historic structure unless it's ruled to have no reasonable beneficial use. The city council made that determination regarding Plaza de Panama when it voted to approve of a renovation in the area that closes the plaza to vehicles. But since the plan involved removing a section of the historic Cabrillo Bridge, the Save Our Heritage organization sued, saying the plaza does serve a reasonable use as a parking lot. So what did this tentative ruling say? Superior Court Judge Timothy Taylor agreed with Soho and blocked the project. Taylor says while the parking lot may not be desirable, it is a reasonable use. Now he's going to hear oral arguments in the case this Friday. The city wants to break ground on the project in time for the park's 2015 centennial celebration. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr. Changes to the proposed Navy Broadway complex downtown have prompted a lawsuit by the State Coastal Commission. The suit names the Navy and the developer Manchester Pacific Gateway. The commission says the plan has changed so much since it was approved in 1991 it now violates state and federal laws. Neither the, nor, neither the Navy nor the developer are commenting on the lawsuit. Backers of the San Diego Convention Center expansion will likely find out in March if their plan is a go. That's when the Coastal Commission decides whether to allow the construction of one million additional square feet at a cost of half a billion dollars. KPBS investigative reporter Amitha Sharma says a key question is what role climate change will play. Scripps Institution of Oceanography scientist Daniel Kayan studies climate change. He didn't make the flood map showing the convention center expansion inundated with water in 2050, but part of his research was used to draw the maps. Research, he says, isn't created in a vacuum. In our case, we try to provide um, fairly unbiased uh, information that decision makers can use, and a lot of them don't want to look ahead. Um, so. There's, I think there's an obligation for scientists to um, raise these flags and provide information. So far, two key agencies, the Port District and the City of San Diego, haven't done much with the information in the maps as they relate to the Convention Center expansion. Publicly, Port Commissioners say the agency must plan for sea level rise, which is projected to increase anywhere between 18 inches to 4 feet along the San Diego Tideline by 2050. This is former Port Commissioner Scott Peters just days before he was elected to Congress in November. Look, if we're going to make an investment like this on our waterfront, we need to be ready for sea level rise. It would, be, um, would not be smart to not consider this as we go forward. But Peters and his former colleagues on the port argued in environmental documents that the law does not require them to factor in future environmental conditions for the Convention Center project. And he and the rest of the commission voted unanimously in September to move ahead with the project without taking into account the flood maps. San Diego Mayor Bob Filner refused to grant an interview on those maps. But during this month's State of the City address, he said San Diego must respond to climate change. You know, rising sea levels demand that we plan now to protect our vital coastal infrastructure and neighborhoods. I don't think we're going to save our beaches 
by continuing to put our heads in the sand. Yet Filner said in the same speech that he's optimistic that construction on the convention center expansion will begin soon. Optimism aside, there is no guarantee that will happen. Before the California Coastal Commission votes on the project, sea level rise is likely to come up. Commission planner Diana Lilly says she's aware of the maps and doesn't think they should be dismissed. She said, quote, we certainly are concerned about the issue of sea level rise and how it affects the convention center expansion. The market may also care. The $520 million project would be financed by bond investors, and they like to know when there are risks. Would it affect an investor? Would it be valuable information to know that the project for which the funds are being raised could be underwater before the bond was paid off? To ask the question is to answer it. Okay, yes, that should be disclosed. Gary Aguirre is a securities attorney in San Diego. He says the city can be clever about what it reveals. So what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to say, there is this risk. You may marginalize it in some way, you know, and, 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 but it has to be accurately presented. And then you have to say, and we have a reserve to cover that. Mitigation measures for sea level rise include seawalls. Richard Gersberg is a professor of public health at San Diego State University. His research was also used to create the maps. He says building a seawall to protect an expanded convention center would require additional barriers elsewhere along the San Diego Bay. One of the problems is in the areas, since the water has to go somewhere, in the areas which are not armored, in some ways you make the flooding worse. So if we armor downtown San Diego, uh, but we don't armor Coronado and don't armor the Midway Sports Arena area, the flooding might in fact get worse in those areas or in Chula Vista. What's more, seawalls run into the hundreds of millions of dollars. Scripps researcher Daniel Cahan says there is little doubt the sea will rise in the near future. The earth is warming, ocean water is expanding thermally and the ground-based ice stocks on Earth, Greenland, Antarctica are the are primary there, are melting. And that's adding to the volume of water in the oceans. In December, a judge ruled that the San Diego Association of Governments ran afoul of state law by not adequately factoring in climate pollution in its environmental review of the region's transportation plan. The ruling followed a lawsuit filed in part by the Sierra Club. Sierra Club activist Misada Dissenhaus says the group may get involved in the convention center expansion project if governmental agencies ultimately fail to pay heed to sea level rise predictions. We should be looking at you know what what sea level rise is going to mean for the buildings uh, that exist there now. Amita Sharma, KPBS News. We asked the County Taxpayers Association to comment on this, comment on the story because of their position as a promoter of accountable, cost-effective, and efficient government. However, they declined. Californians would have precious seconds to prepare for a major earthquake under a new proposal. Senator Alex Padilla says an early warning system would give folks time to take cover or shut down systems that could be damaged by severe shaking. Early warning systems are designed to detect the first pulses of a quake's energy and send out alerts before seismic waves can spread. But as bill seeks to find funding for a statewide system, it's expected to cost $80 million. A little less than the cost of the 2010 Easter quake, it did $91 million in damage to Imperial County. The 1994 Northridge quake caused an estimated $20 billion damage around Southern California. And the 1989 Loma Prieta quake caused about $6 billion in damages to Northern California. San Diego may need a billion-dollar makeover to fix its aging infrastructure from potholes in the roads to repairs at Qualcomm Stadium and Petco Park, plus new fire stations to meet fire and safety standards. Today, the city's new infrastructure committee met for the first time. They passed a tentative work plan to get a thorough assessment of the city's needs. A report is due in two months. The city clerk says nine people have qualified to run in a special election for Council District 4. Eleven turned in papers by last Friday's deadline. The clerk's office is still working to verify paperwork from the remaining two candidates. 
San Diego's annual homeless count officially began last week, but a lot of work still needs to be done to complete the yearly survey. Amitha Sharma is in for Peggy Pico tonight. She has more on the count. This week, volunteers will talk to people on the streets to better understand who the homeless are in the community. Joining me are Dolores Diaz, Executive Director of the San Diego Regional Task Force on the Homeless, and Matthew Packard of the San Diego Housing Commission. Dolores, the count started last Friday. What are the challenges in counting the homeless, given the fact that they often are invisible because of the places, the spaces that they find themselves to shelter in? It is very challenging to count the, uh, count the homeless, especially in the rain, which is what we experienced on Friday between 5 and 8 in the morning. Uh, homeless will tend to go where, um, where they're hidden, you know, to be able to uh, get some shelter from the elements. And, and uh, the people that were out counting on Friday were challenged trying to find them. Last year's tally put the city's homeless count at around 6,200, which was a 9% increase over the previous year. Do you expect to see an increase this year? And if so, what does that mean? What changes? What happens? We really don't know what we're going to see this year because uh, the count is simply a snapshot of a point in time. And, uh, uh, you know, more, uh, more numbers of homeless or less numbers doesn't necessarily mean more resources to our community. So we really don't know what we're going to see. You're also doing this count to perhaps serve as a reminder to people that there are these homeless people out there. I mean, how big of a reminder does it serve? Well, there, it, we do this for a number of reasons. Primarily, uh, we want to know in San Diego how, uh, the scope of, uh, of our homeless issues. But across the country, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development asks uh, communities to count every two years. And, uh, but San Diego has chosen to do its count annually because we want to know, we want to put our, 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 wrap our heads and our arms around the issue, and we want to know specifically what it is that we need to do to address the, the, the issues that face our community, how we can craft services to address, uh, to, to address our homeless in San Diego. Matthew, another annual event regarding the homeless is Project Homeless Connect, where people gather and provide services. Um, what's the purpose of the event? You know, the, the purpose of the event is really uh, kind of like a, a homeless count. It's, a, it's an opportunity one time a year to reach out to that homeless population. The Regional Task Force not only counts homeless people, but they also engage them in conversation and, and survey. What are their needs? How long they've been homeless? A whole host of questions. How vulnerable they are on the street. We're doing the same at Project Homeless Connect. Uh, reaching out to homeless individuals, making them aware of what services exist within the community, and hopefully engaging those folks in those services. So this week's event is on Wednesday. What are the specific services that they need? Sure, there's a whole host of services, from a meal to clothing to a haircut uh, to mental health referrals to substance abuse referrals, housing counseling, veteran-specific services, whole host of services, many organizations that provide services 365 days of the year are going to be in that one spot. So the homeless individual can walk around Golden Hall and touch every one of those service providers. This is also used as an opportunity to basically collect data on who the homeless are. What are you seeing or what did you see last year? Are there more women and children on the streets? Are you seeing more chronic homelessness? Are, do you, are you seeing veterans from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars? Uh, certainly an increase in those veterans coming back from Iran and Iraq um, wars. Um, and uh, there has been an increase in families in the last couple of years because of the downturn in the economy. Um, most significantly, I, I think, is an aging of the homeless population. I think the public community or the community oftentimes maybe thinks that homelessness is something that happens to 20, 30-year-old men. Uh, that's not the case. Um, there are many people on the street that are 50, 60 years old, women, um, very vulnerable individuals. You're also looking for volunteers. How are you getting the word out to the homeless that, that this event is happening? Absolutely. We use those existing providers uh, in the community. Uh, they have flyers, uh, day centers, meal centers. We've reached out to those folks to get the word out in the community that it's happening Wednesday uh, from 9 to 3 at Golden Hall. 
Matthew, Dolores, thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you. Thank you. The Ronald McDonald House in San Diego serves as a home away from home for about 20,000 families a year dealing with premature births, cancer, and other serious illnesses. Tonight, we meet one of those families and their three-and-a-half-month-old baby girl, Hope. This bubbly baby girl is number six for the Nakamura family from Vista. I'm Nicole Nakamura, and this is my husband, Shane. After giving birth to five other children, the couple decided to go the natural route and do it at home. And um, she came out with the cord around her neck. Uh, she wasn't breathing. Baby Hope was immediately rushed to Rady Children's Hospital where they took good care of her. And during our time down here, we, we were able to stay at the Ronald McDonald House, which was a real blessing to us. Mm -hmm. Dad named her Hope because he believed she would make it. Since 1980, families like the Nakamuras have relied on this nonprofit organization for lodging almost free of charge. This is, this is really our living room, if you think about it that way. You come in and, and you can sit down and just take a break for a minute. Chuck Day with the organization says what makes it so unique is its location about 300 feet from Rady Children's Hospital. The 350 bed hospital next door, this proximity is key because we can allow families to come across and use our facility even though they're not staying with us. This is the heart of the Ronald McDonald House or the great room where families take a break. It also includes a commercial kitchen where about 150 families a day can really make themselves at home. can make their own food here, so we'll refill these pantry shelves almost daily. But no hamburgers and french fries? Well, it's funny you should say that because the local McDonald operators are absolutely key to our support here. Uh, they provide about 10% of our annual budget. And the rest they go out and raise in the community to support the campus school for K-12 through students. Room 124. And the 47 guest rooms for families to temporarily live while their child is being treated. This year's Dream House raffle includes hundreds of prizes and a $3.2 million house in Rancho Santa Fe. So we try to create the dream that people want to invest in, if you will, by buying that raffle ticket because, you know, we know our house that needs to be here. And that dream house enables us, is a big part of what uh, enables us to be here in the future. Ronald McDonald House Charities hopes to sell more than 41,000 raffle tickets this year. The final drawing takes place on May 18th. A bipartisan group of senators says they will get an immigration reform bill passed by summer. Today, they unveiled a blueprint for reform with four basic pillars. First, a path to citizenship for undocumented workers who are already here. It would be contingent on securing the border and making sure visitors don't overstay their visas. Next, improving the legal immigration system to reduce backlogs. The plan also calls for a strong employment verification system, giving companies fast and reliable information about who is authorized to work in the U.S. and enforcing penalties for employers who knowingly break the law. Now, the fourth pillar ties legal immigration to employment to ensure immigrants do not displace American workers. Immigration reform has, of course, failed in the past, and some lawmakers are already speaking out against the proposal, but the senators say they believe this is the year it will pass. For the first time ever, there's more political risk in opposing immigration reform than in supporting it. The Republican Party is losing the support of our Hispanic citizens. And we realize that there are many issues in which we think we are in agreement with our Hispanic citizens, but this is a preeminent issue with those citizens. Tomorrow, President Obama will lay out his own immigration reform plan during a visit to Nevada. The Boy Scouts could make a major change in its policy on gays, leaving it up to individual groups sponsoring scout troops to decide whether gays can be leaders or members. The national leadership is discussing the possible change. An official announcement could come next week. Boy Scouts of America has drawn criticism and lost some corporate sponsors because of its long-standing policy. Juarez, Mexico has become infamous for gruesome violence caused by drug lords south of the border, but as we hear from Amitha Sharma, things may be changing. The city of Juarez in Mexico was once considered the murder capital of the world, as we see in this trailer for the film The New Juarez.
should have multiple wars going on. We are the most murderous city in the world. Many businesses are closed. A problem that has led to the death of over 60,000 Mexicans. The country is ravaged. Juarez has achieved a measure of calm due to a tough cop, secret deals between drug lords and the government, as well as the victory of one cartel over another. Filmmaker Charlie Min's latest documentary, The New Juarez, focuses on the declining violence in the city. He joins me now. Take us back a bit. Drug violence peaked in Juarez in 2010. What was happening then? Well, the two drug cartels, the Juarez cartel and the Sinaloa cartel, were batting, uh, battling over this uh, turf space. Uh, through El Paso, Texas. Uh, the two cities, Juarez and El Paso, Texas, are 300 feet apart. So what we were doing as the United States, we were supplying 90% of the guns that are being used to kill all these Mexican people, along with billions in cash for these illegal drugs. So that was what was happening. So what's happening today? How have things changed? Well, Chapo won the war in Juarez. Uh, he's the leader of the Sinaloa cartel. He's the biggest drug lord in the world. So there's less people to kill. So he wiped out the Juarez cartel um, and La Linea. And also, we, you talked about the super cop, Leziola, who used to be the uh, police chief in Tijuana. He lowered the murder rate there, took out the Ariano Felix cartel in Baja, California, went to Juarez to duplicate his success, and he's done that. Uh, he's the only man I'm aware of that's lowered the, that has challenged the cartels publicly and has lowered the murder rates in both cities, Tijuana and Juarez, and is still living. It's an incredible story. And how has he done that? He has sectorized the city of Juarez into six different areas. He's uh, concentrated on downtown to get rid of all the extortions and uh, murders, etc. And he's also fired 800 police officers. So this man rules with an iron fist. It's one of the most amazing stories in Mexico right now. How is he doing all this and staying alive? Another reason which you've touched on is the victory of the Sinaloa drug cartel yeah. over a rival cartel. So uh, doesn't that make this stability temporary until the next drug gang comes along and challenges Sinaloa? Yeah, the most powerful drug organization after Sinaloa is Los Zetas. And uh, they're former U.S. military trained. And so they are ruthless. They'll chop people's heads off, children. Uh, they have no, no boundaries. Uh, they just go after... Uh, the, their next rival. So if Zetas came in to fight Sinaloa in Juarez, we may have a situation worse than in 2010 when the murder rate in Juarez exceeded the 9-11 attacks. Another reason for the decline in violence, um, according to your, your piece, is these secret deals that have been reached between the cartels and government, top government officials. What kind of deals? Well, we're talking about letting the money flow letting the drugs go north and um, basically looking the other way, the government and the police, so that uh, this 30 to $50 billion uh, revenue that's created by this drug war, uh, the cartels maintain that so there's less murders. That's really what it comes down to. And the other major factor is that the federal army and the federal police have pretty much been taken out of Juarez. Those two groups were brought in by Felipe Calderon when he declared war on the cartels December 11, 2006, and those two groups contributed to the murders rather than protecting the citizens. And how would you characterize U.S. involvement in this drug war? Big time accomplice. So the U.S. government needs to do more. Uh, like I said, most of the weapons that are being used in Mexico come from the United States. Look at Operation Fast and Furious. That epitomizes the disaster. So the guns are not just killing our country. It's murdering Mexico. Our failed policies on NAFTA, Plan Merida. Uh, we're still the largest consumer of illegal drugs in the world. But what about the Mexican government's responsibility? A shared problem. There's no question about it. The Mexican government has let their own people down. They've lied to their own people and not given them any jobs or security. And when and where does your documentary air this week? Uh, it opens Friday at the uh, Rancho del Rey in Chula Vista, uh, the Regal movie theater there. It begins this Friday and it's going to play for at least a week and partial proceeds go to the victims. Charlie Min, thank you so much for coming in and speaking to us today. You're welcome. I'm Hari Srinivasan. On the next news hour, Margaret Warner reports on worries in Israel about the civil war in neighboring Syria. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. A four stroke wind and another record for Tiger Woods at Torrey Pines in San Diego today. He won the Farmers Insurance Open for the seventh time, the most in the history of the tournament. 
Wood shot 14 under par to rack up his 75th win on the PGA Tour and just over a million dollars. Los Angeles Dodgers made a TV deal worth up to possibly $7 billion over the next 25 years. They're teaming with Time Warner Cable to create a regional sports network carrying Dodger games and other sports throughout Southern California and Hawaii starting in 2014. Padre fans are still waiting to see if Time Warner will make a deal with their team and Fox Sports San Diego. Look for chilly temperatures tonight through tomorrow morning. A frost advisory goes up. Uh, for parts of the county tonight through tomorrow morning. We should have sunshine with some clouds in the inland valleys the next few days. Sunny and cool in the mountains. Warmer in the desert with temperatures in the mid-70s by the end of the week. You can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS News app all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.